Thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Hsu. And I'm Corey Washington, and we're your hosts for Manifold. This week, we interviewed Andrew Hartman, author of The War for the Soul of America. Next week, we're going to be releasing bonus content, mine and Steve's interview with the editors of two local blogs on campus, The Morning Watch and The Evening Look, which take right-wing and left-wing perspectives, respectively, on campus and national issues. Our guest today is Andrew Hartman, professor of history at Illinois State University Normal, where he teaches courses in U.S. intellectual, cultural, and political history. He's the author of two books, Education and the Cold War, The Battle for the American School, and The War for the Soul of America, A History of the Culture Wars. His current project is on Marx's influence on U.S. politics, currently titled Marx in America. He is co-founder of the Society for U.S. Intellectual History, served as the Society's first president, and co-founded the Society's blog, which has been in his existence since 2007. He's currently host of the Intellectual History podcast, Trotsky and the Wild Orchids. Our topic today is the War for the Soul of America and the new conclusion he has written for the 2019 edition to capture developments encompassing Trump's election. Welcome to Manifold, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me, Corey and Steve. I'm happy to be here. So Andrew and I have known each other for 20 years now. Um, we, That's right. We met in D.C. where we were uh, neighbors in Adams Morgan. Andrew, you were a grad student at GW? Yes, that's correct. And I was a philosophy faculty at University of Maryland. And uh, this was a particularly informative time for me, as I hope we'll get into uh, as our discussion progresses. What I really, what I particularly like about your book on the culture wars is that it covers topics that I think any politically conscious, intellectually curious person would be interested in. And for many of our listeners, who I think are roughly in our age range, they would have lived through these times. And uh, so they'd be aware of these, uh, these issues. Steve and I were talking about this beforehand. As, as we lived through them, I was never quite aware that I was in the midst of a culture war or that it was something that people would look back 30 years on and write a book about. But it's interesting to see that events that you're kind of aware of that just seem vaguely normal are actually a pretty serious um, political and social history. So I want to begin with how you begin the book, and that's a Pat Buchanan speech at the 1992 Republican Convention. Take us back to that speech and tell us why it was important. Yes. Um, and just if I could riff a bit on uh, sort of your reaction to the book, this is a reaction that I've gotten from a lot of people, and that is that um, they lived through it. They couldn't have made sense of it as history. I mean, that's the point of history is sort of refuting memory, but that it really has helped people sort of make sense of, of various events that were either in their lives or sort of in the ethos at the time. Um, and and it's certainly researching the book has done that for me as well. So 1992, um, Patrick Buchanan ran uh, in the primaries of the Republican uh, for the Republican nomination for president of that year, challenging the sitting president, George H.W. Bush. And of course, it's pretty uncommon for a sitting president, an incumbent, to be challenged in the primaries. And Buchanan was challenging Bush because he believed that Bush uh, was not fighting the culture wars. Bush was too lenient, too liberal on the issues that mattered most to Buchanan, a traditionalist, uh, conservative, a Catholic. Some might call a paleoconservative in that he's really interested in these sort of older traditionalist issues. Um, Aside, you know, issues really related to sexuality above everything else. You can't, uh, he's, he thinks that Bush isn't fighting them, and so he challenges them. And he has some success, particularly in, in the early primaries or caucuses and primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire. He, of course, does not come close to the nomination, but uh, owing to the um, success that he had in these early primaries, uh, the Republican Party and the Bush team reward him with a prime spot at the Republican convention that year in Houston. And he gives this really notorious speech in which he declares a war for the soul of America and declares that all moral people must vote for Bush and the Republicans. Otherwise, they would be supporting the sort of nihilism and cultural relativism and, and moral repugnancy of the Clinton administration, of the Clintons. And he, he always talked about Bill and Hillary as a couple because Hillary was notorious for many people as a sort of um, a feminist pushing for abortion rights and that type of thing. 
Um, and this was a notorious speech, and it really was the most memorable speech of that convention. Some people argue that it helped secure his defeat because there was it was too negative, it was too conservative, it was unappealing to moderates. I, I think that's it's hard to know if that's the case. There were so many other factors that led to Clinton's election, namely Ross Perot. But it's and it's an interesting milestone that sort of serves as um, it put put a stamp on cult these div divisions, these cultural conflicts that had been ongoing for quite some time since the '60s. At least that's my read on the history of it. And so it really is the sort of like climax of the culture wars of the '80s and '90s. You know, it's interesting. I, you think back about the Clintons, and in some sense, Pat Buchanan captured what would later become mainstream view about Clinton on the right, that he was harboring in this kind of era of uh, loose morals and uh, kind of cultural relativism across the board. It wasn't that common among regular people, but that view became mainstream among his uh, people. So you identify a range of issues that characterize the culture wars. Let me just go through them right now. Uh, abortion affirmative action, art censorship, evolution, family values, feminism, homosexuality, intelligence testing, media, multiculturalism, natural history standards, pornography, school prayer, sex ed, the Western canon. And when you write about these things, what I begin to ask myself is, I see strains, issues that have kind of followed us through American history, and they've lasted for varying amounts of time. So I want to do two things. I want to first ask you which of these things you think are really still relevant today. Um, but to begin, I'd like to have you read from the 2019 conclusion that you wrote to the culture wars, because that kind of frames the debate about which of these you think are still uh, absolutely relevant. So could you uh, begin with that uh, passage? Sure. Make America great again. <laughs> Donald Trump's campaign slogan, displayed on ball caps and t-shirts or emblazoned on placards at boisterous rallies across the red state landscape, evokes the fervent belief among many Americans that the nation is no longer theirs. Once upon a time, the slogan deftly implies, things in America made sense. Right and wrong were distinguishable, hard work was rewarded, people respected authority, and love of country was widely shared, as was faith in God. But this familiar America, this normative America, now seems upside down in the eyes of millions of the nation's citizens. Of course, it is no coincidence that the rhetorical power of Make America Great Again peaked at the end of Barack Hussein Obama's eight years in the White House. Nothing quite signals decline for the Trump faithful like a black president with a Muslim name. Beyond its present day appeal though, Make America Great Again speaks to the running narrative of decline that has defined conservative cultural attitudes since the 1960s. It is at bottom a nostalgic call to revive and restore the orderly, disciplined and authority respecting America that putatively held fast before the 60s social movements endowed people of color, women, gays and lesbians, immigrants, and other seeming outsiders and fringe characters with the privilege to call themselves Americans. In this way, the multivalent Trump slogan marks but the latest readout in the culture wars that have polarized the United States for decades. Trump and his supporters are breathing new life into the venerable right-wing tradition of complaining that the nation went to hell during the age of Aquarius. So that's the passage. Um, that introduces the new conclusion to uh, the, the second edition of my book, uh, which I wrote, of course, trying to bring the story up to the Trump election um, because the first uh, edition of the book, which was published in 2015 and which I, of course, wrote in 2014, um, did not involve Trump. I think readers were interested in how this history that I had studied so carefully uh, related to Trump's election and the Trump presidency and the movement or the sort of movements that gave rise to Trump. So you, so you, um, you listed out the issues that I deal with in the book as a whole. And what really I think I wanted to stress is that none of those issues necessarily define the culture wars. Um, they were all just sort of 
episodes in a lot in a larger struggle between those who really rejected a lot of the changes that were put into place in the 1960s and after due to the that decade's liberation movements, also due to um, changing attitudes about religion that really crystallized during that time period. And you can see this manifested, for example, in several Supreme Court decisions. There's this this challenge to what I call normative America uh, in terms of a cultural conception of what it meant to be an American prior to the 1960s that really was experienced as liberation for millions of Americans. Uh, it, but it's those movements and this new definition of America or what it means to be an America that was seen as threatening to many more millions of Americans, conservative religious Americans in particular, white Americans in particular. And this is this um, cultural divide that coalesced. And these were the issues that this divide um, saw Saw, saw fought out on you know this was sort of the when, when there were debates about multiculturalism in public school curriculum it was about this larger divide that had um, come to fruition in the 1960s so steve and i were just talking about this before the meeting about uh you know whether this is really a divide so much between kind of white normative america or whether it's a much more messy divide whether it's a divide, in fact, that has many black people and uh, other people of color on the side of conservatives. So, uh, Steve, I didn't know this, but grew up Christian? Yes, my mother is a devout Christian, actually, and so I went to Sunday school and read the Bible until probably about until I was about 12 years old. And my relatives were, you know, not my parents, but my grandparents were extremely religious, and in many ways, they probably— uh, would view the world as um, at least to some extent similar to the many of the conservatives you write about. Um, you know, they were uh, they supported traditional families. They went to church. Um, you know, they probably uh, and I know this from uh, having discussed this often with my relatives. Many were very uncomfortable with gay people, and so you know, I guess we can get into this later on. But part of the theme we want to talk about is it's my sense is. That it's a, the reality on the ground uh, is much is very complicated as far as people's views and what we think of as the culture wars are often things that actually, you know, they're just not that clean when you talk about the lives of regular people. Uh, so I just like to get your initial reaction to that. Yeah. So I'm not going to disagree with anything you just said because it's of course true. And so on the one hand, this can be sort of chalked up to the. Um, the type of historian I am. Uh, there was a famous historian who once said there are two types of historians, lumpers and splitters. Um, those who are really interested in looking at the past and lumping people together and those who are interested in sort of splitting people up. And I've always been a lumper. I find it more interesting to think about um, patterns of human behavior that coalesce. Um, but then I would sort of push back against this characterization. Of course, it's messy, but the logic of the culture wars has pushed people to coalesce around two camps. Now, a lot of people might not recognize it as such, but we see it manifested in cultural behavior, but even more so in political behavior. So for example, um, let me just give you a few examples. So of course, um, the growing Hispanic population in the United States is pretty much as divided culturally as white Americans, if not more so, or they might even tilt more so towards a traditionalist religious perspective um, in relation to sort of like family and sexuality. And in fact, so we start to see this sort of borne out, for example, in the 2004 election when George W. Bush wins re-election against John Kerry, 45% of the Hispanic vote voted for George Bush. And so a lot of people were pro prognosticating at the time that, well, this is indicative that uh, Hispanic voters are just becoming like white voters. You know, they're like sort of following a pattern that previous, say, Southern and Eastern European voters followed in terms of like becoming homogenized in, into the sort of larger American population in terms of voting patterns. And ethni ethnicity was counting far less than, um, than say, religion or attitudes towards the family, various other things. 
Um, but then we saw the Republican Party very shortly thereafter, um, not at the sort of high leadership, not within the Bush administration, but at the congressional level, at the base level, make immigration their main issue. And ever since then, Republican voting patterns have fallen away from I mean, Hispanic voting patterns have much more become much more polarized in terms of most of them are voting Democratic, a much higher percentage than the 40, than the 56 percent or whatever that voted for Kerry in 2004. And you see this played out in a number of different ways that coalitions are formed around the very essence of what I'm talking about in terms of a white normative America. So your um, your religiously conservative grandmother. Um, when it comes to making really important decisions, probably about who she's going to live around or, and I'm not speaking specifically of her, but just as a sort of generic sense, general sense, but more importantly, who she's going to vote for um, because she's black and because the, uh, the other America, the Republican America, the conservative America has made whiteness an issue, has made the defense of American identity around race an issue, um, she's, she's going to coalesce with... Um, yeah, they, they, they never voted for... They never voted Republican, and they would never kind of consider it. Um, look, look, what you say is, is very... It's also true of Muslim uh, voters. I don't know if you remember this, but I think the majority voted for Bush in 2000, and then after the reaction of 9-11, you had a really, really different... Uh, kind of perspective um, people move to. Yeah. And so these issues are, you might say, well, this is just about electoral politics. It's not about sort of like these more existential identity based definitions, but I think the same thing has played out in terms of just a polarization. Um, And it's not like one issue you can point to. There has been since the sixties, even earlier, a large, like anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of Americans identify as white, conservative, and religious. And they tend to coalesce into a cultural and political um, group that tends to vote Republican and that tends to um, sort of fight the conservative side of the culture wars. And so people with whom they're opposed to have coalesced to the opposite side. Um, You can see this more recently, for example, in the fact that um, uh, people who have historically been religious but liberal have quit religion because they have come to identify religion as a conservative thing and vice versa. People whose families are historically less religious or non-religious or maybe have Uh, belong to a mainline liberal church have become much more religious and much more evangelical Protestant or, or conservative Catholic based on the fact that they identify as politically conservative. So you're seeing just polarization that operates around this culture wars divide that I'm isolating as the, as emerging from the social movements of the 1960s and what that did to sort of how we define America. So, uh, Andrew, I wanted to pin you down a little bit more in terms of what you mean by culture war. So in any society at any time, there are a bunch of issues that people disagree on. You know, you could say at any moment there's a culture war if you define it broadly enough. My experience, uh, having been in high school and college in the 80s, is that, and and actually having been on the left, I would say center left, voting almost entirely Democrat uh, during, well, during my whole life, basically, it seems to me that the progressive causes that I championed in the 80s basically all won. Uh, they've all won now, and um, no one even questions uh, the issues like uh, uh, you know, f- equal rights for men and women, uh, different uh, ethnicities, etc. And in fact, the pendulum swung way beyond what I thought was ever going to be possible in the progressive direction uh, in the 1980s. And so now what I find is that in America today, and this is related to the election of Donald Trump, there are people fighting a, desperately fighting a rearguard action to stop the extreme excesses of progressivism that have gone way beyond what would have been considered uh, mainstream progressivism 30 years ago. And so it's a very different culture war than what we would have talked about in the 80s and 90s. What do you have in mind as far as what do you take to be extreme on the progressive side right now? So we went from uh, a time when we would have been very happy if uh, the legal system awarded, say, equal rights to men and women and to uh, whites and other ethnicities in America, and that people got a little bit nicer and more sensitive to each other about uh, gender or ethnicity. Uh, 
And instead, we're in a situation now on campus where there's an ever-increasing set of genders, uh, which we're forced to use. We might be forced to use different pronouns that people choose. It seems like we're teaching our undergraduates to be to act like victims uh, if they can come up with any reason that they or their distant ancestors might have been victimized over. So it, it seems like that's where we've ended up. And, and you, you may smile and think, I sound like some crazy right-wing guy, but I just want to remind you, I'm a left-wing guy. It's just that the system swung way beyond what I thought was an achievable level of progressivism 30 years ago. So I'm, I'm curious, do you agree that the front of the culture war has moved dramatically in the last 30 years? I do agree with that premise. And in fact, in the book, I argue that the left, cultural liberalism, however you want to characterize it, has won most of the issues from the 80s and 90s. But it's a shifting terrain, I think, as you accurately um, characterize. And I think the uh, because of the, you know, like Trump is not a popular president by any standard, by any measure, but because of the weirdness of our electoral college, somebody who represents what you describe as a rear guard, and it really is a rear guard, um, can get elected and then will represent a sort of like a nostalgic view of what America was prior. Um, but yeah, I think that the left has won most of these culture wars, but there's just like deep ironies in that, in those victories that I think make the victories seem increasingly pyrrhic and thus make it such that even people on the left don't feel like anything has been won. And in fact, I think maybe this contributes to how you characterize it as this increasing sort of sense of victimhood, you know, and and so- Sorry to interrupt, but it seems to me that the more the left wins, the more it tries to come up with more things that it absolutely needs to win. You see what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if I would characterize it as that, but what I see is like the very logic of the liberation movements, which I think was extremely necessary in the context of the, like say, nineteen post 1950s was based upon identity and an identity emerged in that sort of context as a, I think, truly emancipatory. I mean, others would argue that it was never emancipatory, but I think there were emancipatory elements there that were necessary in a culture that was extremely conservative relative to um, like women's liberation, relative to black freedom, relative to gay rights. Um, But movements that are based upon the logic of identity, it's really hard. Like, where does that end? It's sort of like the logical conclusion is I guess where we're at now is you keep dividing up more and more identities. And my problem with that is not that it's angering conservatives. I don't really give a shit about that. But um, my problem with that is that it makes solidarity less possible around issues that I think are that, that the left is losing on like social equality and, and and so that's my larger problem with it is like there's all the energy, all the focus has been in sort of dividing us up into smaller and smaller categories. And you might say based on a sense of victimhood, my problem with it is there's like, as like, it's almost like this like Afro pessimism, um, a sense that America can never be redeemed because it's always racism and white people are always racist. It's just, it's like, that leaves us nowhere. And it certainly doesn't leave us with any hope of forming a sort of multiracial coalition to defeat the forces that I think are um, making life extremely difficult for most people. So, I mean, I, I agree that things are alarming. Maybe my sense of what's alarming is a little different than yours. So would you agree with this statement that the left has more or less totally won the culture wars march through all the institutions, not just higher education, but McDonald's, Starbucks, uh, IBM, Apple, uh, et cetera. But perhaps on the economic front, more sort of free market, uh, more regressive uh, policies may still hold sway. Is that, do you think that's fair? Yeah, I totally agree with that. And also I would add to the sort of economic side of things, just politics in general, the Republicans still have a great amount of power. And this gets manifested in like, for example, the Supreme Court, as it currently stands, like people on the left would point to the Supreme Court and say that we're losing the culture wars. So yes, 
we've we on the left have marched through all the cultural institutions, uh, but the White House not always or not necessarily certainly not Congress certainly not like state legislatures, governors' mansions, and thus the Supreme Court. Um, and I think there's a sort of uh, historical logic to this. The thing that really won out in the '60s is just like rights and rights and uh, liberty. Um, and you see this played out. So if you want to sort of characterize the uh, generation of the baby boomers in terms of the politics that they put into play, it's liberation for people from sort of ascripted identities or, or liberation from this normative America, as I describe it, but also liberation from the state to behave economically as people might want to behave. But that gets played out in terms of like immense corporate power. So libertarianism, whether it be cultural or economic, really won out from the 60s. And there's, that's part of the paradox, I think. So I would agree with you that, you know, the Congress, the White House, the Supreme Court, these are still sites of conflict between left and right. But the people that you characterize as being on the right of that battle themselves spout uh, sort of politically correct language that would have been shocking to people in the 1980s. Um, in fact, we had, and that's why uh, Buchanan is called a paleo conservative, because even to the right today, he's a dinosaur, right? So um, the other day, in preparation for this episode, Corey brought in two conservative bloggers from Michigan State University who I think are considered, you know, at least as far as the left goes, they're considered sort of reactionary, not completely far right, but very right figures on I'd campus. I'd say one of them is probably considered very right. Okay. The other make it lumped in with the more prominent guy. But then I was shocked, and maybe we'll use, we'll get some of this audio onto the episode, but I was shocked when we were asking them questions. They res- they spoke in perfect politically correct anti-colonialist speak to us. And I was joking to Corey that if I spoke to you this way in 1990, you'd think I was like pulling, trying to pull something on you, like like trying to imitate uh, Noam Chomsky or something like this. Um, so, so even the people that you consider you're fighting against on the right have themselves been marched through. Their own brains have been marched through by the left. Well, I, I let, of course, we don't have audio for Andrew actually yeah. to listen to it. I wouldn't describe them as sounding terribly left. I think they sounded humanistic. I think they sounded that we have, have to have a need to respect people. And one of them was openly critical of colonialism. There's no doubt about that. But the, but the vocabulary was, ch- you know, like for 1980 or 1990, that vocabulary was very... Uh, of, of course, but right. language changes. Right. But but that language took over, right? The language that was coming from the far left progressive Well, no, no. They, they, weren't, they weren't using them for individuals. They, you know, they weren't using... That's even farther. But they would be familiar with that terminology. That, that's, right? probably yeah. right. that's probably yeah. right. That's probably right. You know, I you know what's fascinating about reading your book, Andrew, is there's a lot of things that exist in the current milieu that I actually no idea where they came from. So I didn't realize that Stokely Carmichael actually is the guy who coined the term structural racism and uh, institutional it, racism. Institutional yeah. racism, yeah. And I didn't realize other things, right? I mean, let me step back. I'm I think we're all fairly critical of identity politics for different reasons. I, I agree with. I think it divides us. I think it makes. I agree with Steve. I think it makes people focus on victimhood. I personally had a problem with it because it, um, if you're in one of these groups, it imposes a kind of group thing that's extremely unpleasant. So I think I grew up in probably the most radical possible context you could. Amherst, Massachusetts was effectively Berkeley East. And all the ideas, all the sort of far left views of the culture war were just normal in Amherst, Massachusetts. Radical feminism, black African nationalism, you know, um, Radical views about the family. And, uh, it was more puritanical. Sexuality quite wasn't there. But you actually couldn't express dissenting views. Uh, and that really continued for a while. As a black person, I think it was... I, I can really tell my friends, if you're Jewish, you can have a wide range of political views from the far left to the far right. No one questions your Jewishness. But if you're black, and you start expressing these views that are conservative, views that I actually don't hold, you're really kind of shamed for doing that. So it was, it was partly that that, that got me. Um, but I did see that there was a core in this your book probably came out of this. There, I think identity politics helped at the beginning of a social movement to unify people so they can work together, to give them a sense of pride. My dad once said about Malcolm X, he said he didn't really change the world, but he changed how black people viewed themselves. I think that's a value. But I think the problem is it sort of lasted beyond its usefulness, and now it's actually kind of constraining. That That's basically my view. So there are um, scholars, someone like Adolph Reed Jr., who um, from a left social democratic or even maybe a Marxist perspective is like 
would argue that there was never value in identity politics. And so he would have argued that, for example, A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin were right in being highly critical of the Stokely Carmichaels of the world in the 60s for sort of siphoning off the energy from the labor movement. And there's value in that. But I think there's also sort of merit in arguing that in that moment, it was important and useful, especially in the context of what I think was a highly repressive culture if you didn't sort of fit this normative America as I'm describing it. Um, But I agree with you. It's outlived its usefulness and it's become in many ways sort of a farce and a parody that it honestly, from my perspective, it it drives me crazy. So I'm not, I'm not steeped in what the current Marxist dialogues are all about, but I got to imagine there are some crusty Marxist revolutionaries who are just shocked at the their successors, these tiny snowflakes, who certainly aren't vigorous enough to mount the kind of class warfare that they would have thought necessary to achieve the Marxian Marxist utopia. Yeah, there's some of that. It's pretty um, interestingly most of the discourse between what I would consider a sort of like universalist Marxist left and this identitarian identity politics left boils down often to electoral politics because for the first time in American history, at least since the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs, but actually I would argue for the first time in American history, there is um, a viable left-wing candidate. And But the fact that he is an old white man has served, I'm talking about Bernie Sanders, of course, has just, this has served as a catalyzing sort of like um, event in terms of dividing people who are uh, these two sets of lefts. And to me, it's been highly instructive. For example, what if I were to say, I just really think it's time for us to finally have a Jewish president? Nobody makes that argument. Yeah, it's, that's a very sensitive uh, line. I think you know it could it could work for you. It could work very strongly against you. Actually, I think I I'm, I agree. With, that's an extremely interesting aspect of the Sanders candidacy is that people avoid that like a uh, landmine. Has anyone actually been discussing that that you're familiar with? Even kind of you know on the down low. Is that I, I mean, I've I've heard lots of people saying, you know, if if they emphasize Sanders is Jewishness too much, it will preclude him from winning the election. I've heard many people say that. Yeah. The the sort of the universalist left that is all bought into Sanders and he, I'm talking about like pe- Democratic Socialists of America which has seen this, you know, this huge growth. They use it as a joke when they hear from people that, well, all things being equal, I want to vote for a woman. They just sort of use it as a joke, like, well, all th- why do you hate Jews sort of thing? It's a joke that sort of plays into the identitarian um, logic. Right. By the identitarian logic, you could just say it's, it's, it's the Jews' turn to have the White House, right? I mean, or it's Andrew Yang's turn to have the White House. But back to this uh, sort of Marxist thing, like I, I just think if we want to defeat billionaires and repossess the country from the oligarchs and all this stuff, how can we depend on some snowflakes that are triggered by the wrong use of a pronoun to actually get in the streets and overcome, you know, uh, those forces of plutocracy? It just doesn't seem very plausible to me. Well, I agree with your political logic. The whole snowflake thing, I think, is overblown. I don't know. I don't experience it on my campus to the same degree that perhaps you seem to be experiencing it on your campus. You know, like, I, I don't know. I, I Like, I, I'm against the sort of, like, use of identity as a primary force in politics, and I think it's been extremely damaging. Um, but I don't feel like my students are snowflakes. I don't know. What do you all think? Is uh, your students have you have they had it? Yeah, we we're not in the classroom anymore. So I, I we part of the reason for inviting those bloggers into the studio was to try to get a sense of what's going on on campus. Um, we did learn that in the residence halls there are guidelines for. I guess, pronoun usage and Halloween costumes and stuff like that. So that that would have been a little shocking to us in the 80s, I think, to have heard about that. Well, you can think about this in a number of different ways. Um, One of the reasons why political correctness emerged as a controversy in the late 80s was because universities began to enact speech codes, um, which maybe was... um, whether you agree with those or not, it was like a typical university administration response to changing dynamics, changing demographics on campus. Um, 
I think we're sort of in a similar moment. Like administ- university administrations are going to not be seen as discriminating no matter if they can help it. And so they're going to sort of enable this type of logic if they can help it, if they, if they must. Um, and, you know, like, so for example, on the Illinois state university campus right now, for the first time since I've been here and I've been here 14 years, we have a very vibrant black student union that has been protesting in the last few weeks, um, the sense that they're not accepted on campus. Um, the main reason for this to me is that for the fir- like the number of black students in the 14 years I've been here has grown from about 4% on campus to about 13% on campus. There's been active recruitment of black students, particularly from Chicago. And it just makes sense to me historically and politically and culturally that a group that um, that sort of comes to this traditionally historically white institution is going to feel discomfort in, to some degree and is going to fight back against it. I personally don't understand what exactly it is that they feel is discriminating against them. It doesn't make sense to me. But from, from a sort of like bird's eye view historically, it could have been predicted. This is what has always happened. I, I think you're saying that even though there's no particular animus against this group, if they come and they discover how isolated they are, they're going to assume something's wrong and then feel like they have to protest against it. Yeah, and there's some, usually something that sets them sets them off. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a sort of like I'm not. Someone gets called. Maybe they feel uncomfortable in class during discussions of race, perhaps, or maybe someone gets called the N word somewhere, or maybe there's some you know uncomfortable event at a party. Um, yeah, there's bound to be friction when groups rub up against each other. Or often, and I think this has been true at ISU, there's um, tension between black students when they're out socializing together and campus security. Mm. That's like a real thing. Yeah. yeah. And a, legit, a legitimate grievous, I would argue. Those pro, their protest at Amherst a few years ago, and I remember talking to the head of the library because the students took over the library during those protests, and um, he was sort of listening to the complaints, and there actually weren't many complaints about events on campus. Uh, students felt that they, some they often felt that they were, I guess, unprepared for college in some sense, and so it was sort of a cry for a certain kind of help. The N word was used, but it was used actually by someone driving through campus when the thoroughfare is probably almost certainly not an amorous person. So it was kind of an expression, I think, of of discomfort. And once you have a th- threshold, when you say thirteen percent, I think that's actually the proportion of black people in the population in the U.S. So once you get mm-hmm. to the threshold, people feel strong enough actually to. And, and we always, as you know, those of us who are poli- who like to think of ourselves as politically engaged professors, we want students like the thing we hate or say we hate is apathy. And but, you know, when our students are engaged in this fashion and students, when they engage on campus campus, it's it's often about things outside of campus, the larger world that they're protesting, but campus is their place. Um, and we don't like the results. I, I just think we, should, we, we as like campus professors and, and administrators should just be a little patient, even if we don't sort of like the trajectory of their politics necessarily. I mean, I see it as my role to help them if I can, and if they're willing, sort of understand the larger context of what's going on and maybe they can have a more effective politics. Um, but of course, that's tricky because, you know, identitarian politics would l- lead itself to the logic that me as a white man would have trouble sort of explaining or so- sort of teaching them anything with regards to why they should be mad or protesting or that type of thing. <laughs> when I see students here protesting, even if I disagree with what they're pushing for, I always feel like, you know, these are young people, they have energy, they're trying to make society better. So I always try to look at it from that perspective, even if I disagree with what they're pushing for. I I wanted to ask, just broadening our discussion out from campus a little bit to the whole country, um, it seems to me that you've got one political party saying, yay, white people are soon going to be a minority in this country, and we're every day working as hard as we can to reach that uh, promised land. And it seems to me like, kind of crazy to think that a very large fraction of white people aren't going to find that a little bit disturbing. And so do you think that in the future we're 
inevitably going to end up with culture wars that are more and more polarized by race in this country, with the Republican Party becoming the party of white people? Well, I, I feel like we're already there. Um, is it going to be more polarized by race? I mean, right now, there's still a fair number of white voters who vote for Hillary, or whereas I think that that could change. I think that it could become even more debased. Um, I recently read Naomi Klein's new book, Agree or Disagree with Her, her Politics. She makes, I think, a really interesting point, and it's about it's a defense of the Green New Deal. And her argument is that as we begin to experience the effects of climate change, um, we have to, we, we can't try to deal with climate change through policies that are external to social policies, because the main thing that we're going to experience at a political and social level is predominantly uh, like white populations, whether it be North America or Europe or Australia, setting up sort of like barriers to people from elsewhere. I feel like we're already there at a micro level compared to what it might be, and that this creates a sort of racial animus that can be extremely dangerous, and that I think will dominate our politics for many years coming going forward. Um, but where that leaves uh, Black Americans, <laughs> or where that leaves minorities who are already in the United States, um, is an open question. Or where that leaves like white, good white liberals, is an open question as well. I think, and Corey has made this point as well. I think where it leaves an individual Black person or an individual Asian American person, it's not clear, right? You could they could come out on either side of this, as my. Rab- rabidly pro-Trump cousins from Los Angeles, uh, you know, uh, are evidence of. But as far as the white population, it just seems very plausible to me that they're going to concentrate more and more heavily in the Republican Party if the Democratic Party keeps going in the direction that it's currently going in. Do you do you agree or disagree with that? Well, the data doesn't look like that, actually, at um, the generational level, right? The problem is, is that social issues uh, are pretty important to people's voting. And the young people bought into the left social program. Basically, you know, they they're not they're not religious. They want a multicultural society. They want uh, sex ed. You know, they they in to the extent that climate change is sort of a social issue. They're pro uh, taking steps toward to mitigate climate change. So that I think is a force which is actually working strongly against Republicans. And it, look, of course, these this is a, you basically have a, a series of force of actors right, pushing parties in different ways. There's a racial component. But there's a social component, and this this point it looks like the social component is actually winning, is the as far as the choice for Democrat over Republican. Right. So young. so one one alternative hypothesis would be the Republican Party is going to become increasingly the party of old white people, but not white people. I think that's possible. I also think it's very possible that younger white Americans are going to end up in the Republican Party if the Democratic Party continues in the trajectory that it's in. I mean, I'm not saying that we know the answer, but I think they're both possible. I mean, I think Corey's right that generational trends would lean against this thesis that the Republican Party, like more and more white people will move into the Republican Party. But, I, you know, I, I wouldn't hang my hat on generational trends lasting. Um, there's a famous line by Khrushchev, you know, like he some party apparatchik told him that, oh, well, it's hard to make these changes because of all the old, you know, like the old ladies but eventually they'll be dead. And Khrushchev said, no, there'll just be more old ladies. Um, and I, you know, so it's, I think it's really difficult to sort of like hang our hat if we want this sort of like progressive social change, hang our hats on generational change. Uh, it may or may not happen, but people have been waiting for that since the sixties. And it's been long been the case that, oh, well, people argue once a certain demographic dies off, things will be dramatically different. And in some cases it's happened, like with these cultural changes you've talked about that you have seen that have been like rather alarming in terms of the sort of shift. But in other ways, um, you know, especially when it comes to sort of, I don't know, like racial animosity, maybe we haven't seen as much uh, transformation generationally speaking as we would hope. I would actually kind of disagree with that. I think um, just my personal which part the, 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 I think there's been a serious reduction in racial animosity actually I mean coming to uh, the Midwest has been extremely enlightening for me um, you know I spent 10 years on the West Coast part of it in Seattle in the 90s I lived in DC New York and I'm living probably in the kind of most conservatively socially part of the country that I've ever been in and I'm 
shocked at the racial comfort you experience uh, walking around here. Being a member of the bi-coastal elite, Corey thought that Michigan was part of Appalachia or the Deep South <laughs> before he moved here. He, so he's shocked that there's actually a different part of the country with different and, and areas. Even, and even when you get outside of like the core part of East Lansing, I'm surprised. So, you know, I'm just saying as, as a black person, I walk into places right now to like have breakfast that, that are all white and not like, not like you type white guys, Andrew, you know what I mean? Like the, the people who look honestly like what people would call rednecks and they're perfectly nice. And this, there's no discomfort. There's no, they're playing with my kids. They're smiling. They're being incredibly nice. I, I took my father into these places and I point out to him that this would have been a very uncomfortable experience 20 years ago, right? And I've had, I, I think I've told all of you about the experience, you know, being in Seattle and walking into an IHOP with a lesbian friend I was traveling with and having the place go silent, right, in Bellingham, Washington in mid-90s. It's, it's, it's totally different here, right? And you go into many, many contexts here where I'm the only black person um, and there's just sort of no response. People, are, the, the reaction is just very, very different. And I think it's, I think, Racial, there's been significant racial change among the young, and I mean, I think it's actually captured in polls. Um, but I think these kind of high-profile clashes you see, like Charlottesville and so forth, are very different. Let me give you an example. I think it's actually worldwide. I was in, I was in Munich about two years ago, and spring they have a kind of small version of Oktoberfest, and I walk into this massive beer hall, and um, people are drinking. I'm, I'm a little bracing myself, right? I'm walking in there to this, I think, are sort of large numbers of potentially drunk young Germans. I'm thinking, oh God, you know, am I, am I going to get looked at? Am I something said to me? And I walk in and like, nobody noticed me except for these three interracial black girls who looked up and kind of smiled. Other than that, I was completely invisible. And that's, 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 that's a generational change, right? It was not like that when I was in Germany frequently in the late 80s and 90s. Well, I have to agree with your sociological observation, Corey. I think uh, the level of tension between ethnic groups in the country has gone down since 30 years ago. Meanwhile, the shrillness of people screaming about their victimhood and identity has gone up by several uh, orders of magnitude. So I find it very strange. People who are shrill and screaming about their victimhood and identity include white men, some white people. Like it's not just a... Sure. Yeah, this is an issue that actually came up a little bit with our discussion of our conservatives where we're trying to discuss benefits to being white and, you know, detriments, and he was not down with acknowledging there are many benefits. Um, so I, I want to get into a couple of the modern, what you think are the really modern issues um, with the culture war. So the obvious one, again, is the current version of race exemplified by uh, Black Lives Matter and the issues of uh, debate over police brutality. Um, Trump calling MF NFL players took the uh, knee sons of bitches. Uh, Trump's birtherism. Um, you kind of compared Trump to Reagan in your conclusion, and you recall the speech that uh, Reagan gave in Neshoba County, Mississippi, which is where the three civil rights workers, uh, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, were murdered in 64, and he talks about states' rights, kind of giving a uh, kind of, um, you know, a kind of dog whistle, basically, about uh, racial animus being okay. You say that Trump's kind of dispensed with a dog whistle. He's just sort of picked up a blowhorn. That seems to me the case. Um, and I think this is consistent with like Steve describing this rearguard action. Trump delights his audiences in not being PC, in fact, in being as anti PC as possible. And part of this has been uh, dispensing with uh, coded race talk in the ways like the coded language of somebody like Nixon, who, when he made law and order a massive issue in 1972, people knew what he was talking about to some degree, or the right people knew what he was talking about. He's trying to win over Southern white voters or with Reagan in that instance. Um, this does not seem to be the case with Trump. I mean, it's not like he's speaking necessarily like Bull Connor, but there's uh you know, he's pushed buttons that I don't think have been pushed by a major national figure in quite some time. Um, and to me, that's a little bit different. And maybe uh, it has to do with um, this sort of aggrieved sense amongst a small minority of people. But it's a, it's a large enough minority that can still, if it coalesces correctly, bring electoral victory.
it's quite shocking to me actually that this works. I would never thought that this kind of polarization would main keep some a viable candidate. I thought you'd you'd solidify a certain base, you drive off enough people, and uh, that would lead you to be um, have too few voters to actually viably compete in an election. Well, if you if you think about the context of the electoral college, and if you think about the advantages demog- democ Democrats have demographically, and we've spoken to these, right, especially um, growing urbanization and cosmopolitanism, et cetera. Um, it's really the only viable option the Republicans have right now. And he just did it really well, I think, and did it in a, but, but I don't think, I don't think even then it could usually work. I don't expect it necessarily to work in 2020. I think that the democratic candidate in 2016 ran a really incompetent campaign and was the wrong candidate. Um, So, I mean, maybe I'm being a little bit hopeful for 2020, but um, I don't think it's, at a national level can often work, but in the context of an electoral college that really just is about five states, it can work. I, I don't know about your optimism about Trump being defeated. I think there's a very good chance he's going to win in 2020. <laughs> I mean, I would put odds. At, I mean, I think he could for the very reasons we're talking about. Terrible candidates on the Democratic side? Yeah, that's the real issue. Well, it's hard to know. I mean, the idea of what's what makes somebody a good candidate doesn't really emerge until they get in the general election like it's it's all there's always hand wringing about candidates up until the general election 2016 amongst many democrats being um different because they thought hillary clinton was the perfect candidate and it turns out she was not a good candidate whatsoever yeah of course it is hard to predict and there's a lot of kind of monday morning quarterbacking um i personally am kind of shocked at the weakness of the candidates that are running right now. All of them, you know, have just obvious problems, you know, that I think everyone can see going to this election. I'm not sure that's always true. We can identify, you know, Biden looks like he's too old, maybe cognitively impaired. Bernie looks too far left and he just had a heart attack. Warren looks like she's from Massachusetts. She's hyper left wing. She has a pol- main policy proposal that most people don't like, and she's a Harvard professor, right? Pete Buttig, uh, is a mayor, right? We never elected a mayor before, and he's gay, right? We never elected a gay person before, right? I, I think it's rare to find, be able to sit back and be able to identify, you know, a set of people who are the leaders in a campaign who look like, you know, they can't, may not be able to beat a very weak candidate on the other side. Well, I mean, and you're focusing on sort of the particularities of the candidates, but I would say that the larger issue and the, why so many Democrats are uneasy going into 2020 is because there's a massive divide in the Democratic Party itself uh, between a left and center that hasn't been this um, animated since the 60s or early 70s. And so a party that divided and the Democratic Party is divided. The only thing that unifies it is its desire to defeat Trump. And that might be enough. But a party that divided, it's going to seem as if the candidates are weak because they're having trouble sort of gathering anywhere near a majority of Democrats. I think it's an independent reason to be concerned, right? I think. Yeah, I think Corey's reasons were independent. Of I think the weakness of the candidates are, it seems to be objective. And then there's other problem hanging out there, too, which is the division. I, I'm curious what you think of my heterodox view on Trump as somebody who is old enough, I think Corey and I are older than you, to remember when Art of the Deal came out and could be purchased at Walden Books during the Christmas season. Um, you know, this guy has been a Manhattan Democrat, really, social progressive, donate a lot of money to Democratic candidates. I think the Clintons attended, or he attended Chelsea's wedding, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a guy who's mainly been on the left, actually, or at least progressive, even though on the right, maybe on economic issues, because he's a business guy. And then like, just realized that um, no one's willing to talk about immigration, which a lot of Americans care about. And he was willing to touch that third rail and then also to be on PC. And being a very, very gifted sales and marketing kind of con man like guy basically won the election. Um, but he's not actually intrinsically a disciple of Adolf Hitler, despite uh, the way the left wants to portray him. Well, his main rise to power is so a clearly racist trope of calling Obama, questioning Obama's citizenship, right? Yeah, birtherism. It is, it is weird that 
during the Obama presidency, bought into this birther theory and was involved in that kind of thing. Bought but, into it. He basically created it. Okay. I don't know if he actually created <laughs> not create, it. Not created, but he took it from a marginal phenomenon. Sure. To... He he was involved in that, which I think is a little bit strange. Um, he, let, he let it. He let it. I mean, okay. it wouldn't have been a thing without Trump. But, yeah. but if you look at, you know, if you, if you just ask, for somebody who's been watching him for over 30 years, I never had in my mind that he was a racist. Even at the Central Park Five? Even at the Central Park yeah. Five uh, advertisements? I, I think you got to go back and look at the facts on the Central Park Five. Don't judge it by the Netflix documentary. Uh, I think I, I remember following that in real time. The situation was quite different than people currently remember it. But but the guy that confessed. I mean, another guy confessed. And it, well, but he, even his confession is not reliable. So, but Trump's and, reaction to it, I think, is indicative. When I think of Trump, I, I mean, I agree with you in many respects. He sort of became a cipher, but. On the other hand, he has he and his father especially have this long history of being these asshole slumlords, like the biggest <laughs> slumlords in the entire city of New York. And, you know, that there's a sort of like harsh, crude politics of class and race there that I think fits his current persona as a president. Um, but, you know, he's basically the asshole that the right was looking for. And it's worked really well for him. And he knows how to be the right kind of asshole. I would say the right was not looking for him. The right has tried to destroy him, you know, from the very beginning because he's not an establishment Republican. He's in some ways too progressive for them. Andrew means the image of the right, the the Fox News populist right, not the right establishment. Oh, sure, the populist right he won over because he he set out to win over, but the Republican establishment has been very anti-Trump from the beginning. Yeah, so I, I had in mind, um, you know, the base, the the voters who are looking for somebody. I, I agree to- with that. And the Fox News pundits, I mean. Most of most them, but of not them. all of them. Most of them. Yeah. And but, but Trump, I think, is also, um, you know, like he's the type of person, once he finds people who love him, he's going to adopt whatever um, ideology is required to, conti- to continue to gain their love. And so he, I, I think he's fully bought into his policies now, or his rhetoric now. Uh, fully bought in. Yeah, I think you might be right about that. I, I think these aren't were not deeply held beliefs for most of his adult life, and then but maybe now he's heavily attached to them. But yeah, even, even there, it's not entirely clear. <laughs> like, I mean, it he, doesn't matter though. It doesn't really matter what he believes. You know, this is a, something that it, it, I mean, a couple of things don't matter, right? It may not matter what he believes. His actual behavior doesn't matter beyond the policy he pushes. You know, the people who support him want him. I think, and this is not a political maturity to some extent. They just want certain policies enacted. They don't yeah. care who the vehicle is, how that vehicle behaves, what that vehicle believes. And it's something very different from the left, who I think requires a kind of virtue test for their politicians. And uh, I think that is a sign of real politic that the left should probably learn from. I mean, you can see this in the in their different response to the Me Too movements, like Trump. Did, what Trump has done and admitted to is far worse than anything Al Franken's ever done. Uh, but one is still the president and the other was kicked out of the Senate. Without I mean, investigation. He, yeah. That, that, that was a tactical mistake on Franken's. Uh, well, it's on the Democrats' part also yeah. for hounding him out of yes, the Senate. Yes, exactly. Um, so this brings us to another one of the current issues, which is the Me Too. Um, and you discuss this uh, as sort of um, next generation feminist movement uh, that emerged since your book. How do you view this in context of the previous culture wars? So there's a lot of continuity because um, one of the main uh, sort of uh, main premises of the feminist movement, women's liberation that that emerged in the 60s and 70s was the sort of consciousness raising about the issues that seemed to matter to them, especially related to like being a woman in a, man dominated world um and part of it was like finding ways to s- female solidarity as a way to sort of break entrenched power and to me that seems like what this that's been part of the logic of me too is um it's like being public about the things happening to you and finding allies amongst other women in particular um in order to uh shame and criminalize behavior uh, towards women. I mean, the, there's a lot of continuity there. Um, and, you know, I think um, as with the 1980s, 1990s feminism, it's 
take it's been taken to some weird extremes and there's been strange bedfellows uh, i probably shouldn't use that term but um like for example when some feminist theorists like katherine mckinnon formed a, and andrea dorkin formed alliances with the christian right in the 1980s and they're um sort of in anti-pornography politics i see this manifesting in some strange ways with me too and just like there's a sort of like moral puritanicalism that it gets tied to it and so there's like the impetus of me too i think is um is powerful and and uh necessary in many respects but it just plays out in weird ways and so in my conclusion i write briefly about how there's one woman who is sort of trying to get a 1936 painting pulled from the Metropolitan Museum in New York based upon some sort of like depiction of a teen, a, fem, a woman te- or a girl teenager. It's a 1936 painting. And so, um, I think it's 38 actually in your, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the factual correction. Well, there, do- <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any uh, allowances made for the fact that norms were different, you know, just 20, 30 years ago, let alone a hundred years ago. And so yeah. everything is, from the past is being judged by the current zeitgeist, right? So, Andrew, I wanted to ask you, I think you occasionally write for Jacobin? Yes. And I, I listen to their, I think they have a podcast, which I listen to. So I'm curious, uh, what what is the view of the, I don't know if you guys get together, like uh, the Jacobin, you know, the social milieu, like what, what, what's your view of uh, how things are going to go with neoliberalism and, uh, you know, um, income inequality, all these things, all these uh, things which you guys must be heavily opposed to? Yeah. Oh, I can't speak necessarily for Jacobin, but my sense is that although most of them, I think, are pretty realistic, there's more optimism amongst them than there probably is amongst, uh, probably is on my part. Um, and you know, they, they look around at their milieu and they see, um, you know, like the popularity of Bernie Sanders, they see de- the rise of democratic socialists of America to 60,000 members, which doesn't sound like a lot, but actually for a left-wing organization in the United States, it's pretty significant. They see these things and they see the crumbling popularity of centrist positions in the democratic party. Um, and they, they tend to be pretty optimistic, uh, my view is that I think neoliberalism as a sort of like valid ideology is crumbling, but its practice will persist for many, many years going forward. And the ideologies that will come to replace it are more likely to be right wing than left wing. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't fight for the left wing version. Yeah, I sort of agree with you. It seems like it's maybe more going to be a left wing, I mean, a right wing response to dissatisfaction among, say, working class people. Yeah. But I think that's like one of the larger indictments of neoliberalism is that it really has paved the way, like the destruction of the basic social democratic consensus of the post-war era across the developed world. Neoliberalism has destroyed that and it, and the the sort of most common response to it has been a right-wing populism. Um, and to me, that's an indictment on neoliberalism, more, much more so even than its own policies. I think the one thing where there's pretty strong bipartisan support in Washington is the idea that uh, China is an existential threat and that the United States has to react in a strong way to China. And and that might be the strongest uh, threat to neoliberalism (laughs) that, you know, rather than, oh, we're grinding our own people into dust, uh, you know, it's it's more that, oh, if we keep uh, allowing free trade, et cetera, the Chinese are eventually going to own America. Um, It seems like that second issue has more traction in Washington than the other one. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, let me ask you you both this. I tend to think that historically speaking, and this speaks to the larger issue of neoliberalism and what what replaces it, if anything, but I tend to think in the grand scheme of things, like 50 years from now, Obama will not be looked on favorably for a whole host of reasons, his eight years of presidency, but one of the main indictments of him is that Donald Trump became president after him. You know, it's... Again, I, I I don't have a view of this. I guess my general sense is he would be looked at positively, but I think a lot of the reaction again to Trump from Trump was in part the economic uh, consequence, but I think that was partly the financial crisis, and perhaps Obama did not do as much. But look, Trump was also a racial reaction to Obama, and you can't hold the guy responsible for uh, a, ra- yeah, a kind of yes. racial backlash. 
No, 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 no. That's like that's blaming the victim, and we don't do that. I'm, yeah, I mean, but, but it's even, but in a weird way, not just the victim, but like a um, it's comp, it's it's sort of not even the victim's behavior, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe it was a wrong time to elect a black president, right? You could say, um, and I, one could argue that it was a bit too early, and America was just not ready for. It. I argued strenuously before Obama was elected. America's not ready for a black president. There's no fucking way America will let be elected black president. Let's be realistic about this. You know, of course, I proved totally wrong on the electoral outcome, but I get it. You look, it's very hard to see how this will play out. I, I would be surprised if he's viewed very badly, but I think many people close to him acknowledge he did not do enough in the aftermath of the financial crisis. He did not hold the banks accountable. He did not do enough to shore up people who lost their homes and lost uh, their businesses through it. And he's just way too easy on Wall Street. Yeah, I think that if you're on the right, then you were, you know, you might say, hey, Obama wasn't that bad because he basically bailed out Wall Street. He was pretty friendly with the financiers. No problem. He was a big supporter of neoliberalism. If you're on the left, the criticism of him will be just that as well, right? Uh, I, I don't think that blaming him for Trump is really very fair. No, well, I mean, okay, so it's an overstatement, but it's a productive one. Uh, Obama, if you're just a Democratic functionary, Obama, as the leader of the Democratic Party, did very little to build the Democratic Party. That's certainly true, yeah. He built his own organization uh, to the nines. Hey, Andrew, I'm curious what you think of these. this recent, I think it's a recent phenomenon of r people who were just recently president, like less than a decade ago or five years ago, suddenly having net worths of $100 million, or in the Clintons' case, $500 million. I, I think there's it's, it's a new level of corruption. It seems to me that in the past, rich people would fund your campaign, and the deal would be, we will make you the most powerful person in the world for four years or eight years, but you're not going to become a centimillionaire as part of the bargain on the back end. And yet now, I think it's especially with the Clintons and now Obama, I think if you check Obama's net worth, rather mysterious to me, um, these guys are all phenomenally wealthy. And that, that seems to be a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah, I think it's... Um People, critics would say this is the neoliberal grift. Yes. No, that's exactly how I would characterize it. Yeah. And th and that's why um, the Ukraine thing is really tricky for Democrats, in particular Biden, because it's very clear that his son got rich off of his name yep. and off of nothing else. Yep. And maybe it might be a legal form of corruption, but it's still a grift and people are going to see it for what it is. And so I don't think, you know, the more attention drawn to Ukraine, the less Biden comes out looking well, which is one of the reasons why he's been very quiet on the whole and thing. I, I think they, Pelosi at all were ready to burn Biden uh, in order to proceed with what they're currently doing, right? They just probably concluded like uh, he's too old, cognitive decline, someone else will be our candidate so we can burn this guy to attack Trump again. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah. You make an interesting argument linking neoliberalism to the debate over the canon. So if you could just read the passage where you really argued that, yeah, the left won the culture wars, but it was, uh, uh, but in the end is all made irrelevant by neoliberalism. Yes. And this is an argument that I don't know if it's pleasing anybody, but I make it anyways. Um, here it goes. American universities are currently more racially and ethnically diverse than ever, and women form the majority of college students nationwide. Aligned with these new demographics, the humanities are taught in much more inclusive ways. The canon is livelier than ever. The left won those culture wars, but the victories have proven pyrrhic. These days, not enough students want to study the humanities and justify their existence to cost-conscious administrators and few public voices are heard defending them, especially conservative voices. In the dog-eat-dog -dog world of neoliberal capitalism, a humanities education of the type that inculcates intellectual curiosity and humanistic empathy serves no purpose compared to such real-world pursuits as vocational and managerial training. The neoliberal outlook, which pervades politicians from right-wingers like Wisconsin governor, now ex-governor, Scott Walker, to liberals like Obama, is fine with revised canons, with more inclusive, multicultural understandings of the world, but not with public money supporting something so seemingly useless as the humanities. In the age of neoliberalism, people who call themselves conservatives have abandoned their traditionalist defense of the Western canon in favor of no canon at all. Culture warriors have been overtaken by events. 
a bipartisan neoliberal consensus that emphasizes job training as education sin qua non now dominates the landscape. Now, I think um, the, some of that I agree with and some of that I disagree with. I, I, in general, I find the term neoliberal a little bit squishy because I think anything that encompasses Obama to Scott Walker to Pinochet is, <laughs> <laughs> is not yeah. a very um, it's not a very uh, it, it's definitely well, I think a squishy it's term. easily definable as the idea that markets best serve society serve society better than government. I don't think Obama yeah. believes that. Uh, he often acted as he did. Well, I, but see, I'm not I'm not describing Obama necessarily as neoliberal, but his attitude towards education was often neoliberal. Well, I think he, look, I think he did a few pretty salient things, right? At one point, he makes fun of art history majors. Um, and at that point, he does joke that vocational training is bound to make more money than history majors. Um, I don't know if the guy, he may be right, in fact, in saying that, but he did not try to cut NEH or NEA. Uh, he, you know, he didn't go out of his way to increase their funding, but, you know, he was a mainstream Democrat when it came to supporting the arts, uh, and humanities. He may have been more realistic about the fact it's a really challenging job uh, environment out there. You know, my sense of the real change in stu- what students study is it really comes from the students themselves. Kids are worried about getting jobs, and they're making a calculation, which I think, in fact, may be wrong, that not studying humanities at all is the best way to get them there. I think there's actually pretty good evidence of having some technical training and having uh, c- critical thinking skills, which you get from courses like philosophy, are actually incredibly useful, right? I mean, their studies have shown that philosophy increases critical thinking skills and not much else does. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Not much else philosophy. Well, I guess the evidence was philosophy is is, is probably the largest uptick. Writing 20, if you you touch people's critical thinking skills, right, when they come into school, what the book Left Behind found, you have to basically write approximately 40 pages a semester, 20 pages a semester, 40 pages a semester, and then read a certain amount of pages a a week. And that's what they found increased your score on this. But people in engineering did remarkably badly on critical thinking skills. You can just look at the book. It's kind of a shocking surprise. Well, I mean, it conforms I, It conforms to my expectations. I just thought like the isolation of philosophy as the discipline. Uh, that, no. <laughs> I, 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 th- I found that peculiar. <laughs> I, I disagree with what Corey just said, but I don't think we have enough time to get into it. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to put a marker in that. We can, we can invite the uh, left, the um, academic drift guys on to come talk about uh, their yeah. findings. But I, I do want to say that uh, in your, this, this piece that you read. Yeah. So uh, I, I feel that um, the right wing defense or lack of defense of the humanities you know, there's a little bit of a counterfactual that you have to explore here, because if the humanities had stayed uh, in support of the Western canon, I think there would be stronger conservative uh, support for it. So there's sort of two independent factors here. Is the knowledge that you're gaining economically useful? And that plays more along these neoliberal lines. And the second issue is, did they just gut the humanities and turn it into some multicultural grievance studies discipline, and now they don't even learn, they don't read Plato or Socrates or Shakespeare, and so why should I defend that? Um, so there's sort of two axes here that are that are going on. Well, yeah, there's no doubt, and these aren't mutually exclusive, actually. But I, I, you know, I find it historically conservative, I mean, historically um, interesting, historically peculiar that within 30 years, the mainstream conservative line on the humanities as stated by people like Alan Bloom or William Bennett, William Bennett, Secretary of Education at the time, was that all Americans should be reading these core humanities texts and we would be a better nation, a better citizenry for it. You don't hear arguments like that made very often, at least not in the mainstream by conservatives anymore. Rather, the more likely argument is... Like, for example, recently in Florida, they proposed legislation such that it would be more expensive tuition at state universities if you majored in the humanities because they consider it a luxury. I mean, this is a shift. And I'm not saying that these two different, these two things are exclu- mutually exclusive. If conservatives had won the canon wars, maybe they would be much more on board with it. But I, I tend to think of it as a larger sort of shift away from a humanistic even to some degree, paleo right to a much more libertarian right. Well, if you look at, um, I think there is a division 
uh, on the right, as far as these attitudes goes, you read some of the sort of, I guess some call highfalutin conservative publications, they're still very much supportive of the canon, right? You know, if you go back and look at uh, magazines like, you know, National Review, and I don't know if commentary is still around, but, you know, National Review definitely has regular reviews of uh, great books and and kind of you know, books about great books and so forth. And what you're seeing uh, in the cost cutting at the state level is really Republicans who are just not fundamentally intellectual, probably, uh, or just maybe much more vocationally oriented, right, and just don't see value in it. But I think it, in the same way, in the left, you find the same division. I think Steve's entirely right. It's not just that the, I mean, the academic departments have to realize they need a constituency outside of themselves to survive. You can't be inwardly focused on navel gazing or alienate yourself from public funding. And it, you can go in a crazy direction like a lot of people have gone as far as these eth- identity studies. But philosophy did, made exactly the same problem, right? Analytic philosophy tried to imitate science and got so narrow that nobody else outside of analytic philosophers, even inside philosophy, other people just stopped caring about it. And it's begun to dwindle just for that reason. And so unless you can show some value to society, and philosophy can argue that, look, you know, they do incredibly well in the LSATs, right? I think they get the best score in the LSAT. That's about, that was their selling point for years. Students would take them if you want to become pre-law. But I feel like the history, philosophy, history, some of the major disciplines of the humanities have shifted gears in the way that you would advise them to. Certainly history has. Um, maybe not English yet, but, uh, you know, there's there are a lot of prominent, prominent historians who are making the very case that you're making, somebody like Jill Lepore, um, and who are trying to write for broader audiences and also trying to advocate for a history that could, can connect with non-academic constituencies. That's happened a little bit in philosophy, right? But a lot of philosophy has gone in a very different way towards critical race studies, again, a kind of identity t- politics. Some people have begun to write for more, you know, kind of public policy type audiences, but it requires a very different skill set than what most philosophers have. You actually have to be able to do research on kind of empirical topics. Yeah. Whoa. Well, yeah, it's, but it's, I mean, for you, like you, it may not seem unusual, but philosophers used to just <laughs> putting together arguments in the, abs- in the absence of evidence. That's much easier. You know, I, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that neoliberalism has killed it. I think students are much more practical now, just fundamentally, right? I have friends whose kids graduate from Amherst College, the top schools, who have a really hard time finding jobs. But I think Andrew's point would be the, the sort of triumph of neoliberalism has forced families and individual kids to be thinking mainly about their economic prospects, and they're in that way driven uh, this direction of decline of the humanities. Has neoliberalism forced Amherst College graduates? I just, it just, there's economic changes that may be independent of it, but maybe you know, it's all the neoliberalism, but it's just. Well, I, I don't know the numbers at Amherst, but at elite, like Ivy League institutions, um, many of the humanities disciplines, especially history, are still thriving. It's been at like the lower mm-hmm. level, it's state institutions, places like my school, where we've been hurt. We're actually doing fairly well, but a lot of that has to do with be- the fact that we train teachers and for whatever reason, people still want to be history teachers. Um, yeah, I'm not honestly sure about the enrollment to these places, but I do know the humanities majors at some of these elite schools have had trouble finding jobs coming yeah, in. Yeah, I think so that's true. it's on true. their mind. I think know. that's true. But I, I guess just to repeat myself, I, I think the issue is if you, if you think of neoliberalism as this system that forces people to really be focused on economic outcomes and secondly creates pretty strong uh, wealth and income inequality then basically as a family you have to be very very focused on you know not missing your chance to have a lucrative career and uh, you know not incur a lot of debt and all those pressures i think probably are problematic for the humanities yes especially for first generation college students which we're getting an increasing higher percentage of at places like Illinois State University, um, you're, you're the first person in your family to go to college and your parents are making a lot of sacrifices for you in a tough job market. Um, I get it. They're not going to, they don't want their kids to major in something as esoteric as philosophy. But, but getting back to this definition of neoliberalism, you could say, well, I don't know what you mean by ne- neoliberalism, but when a billion Indians and a billion Chinese exactly. entered the labor market, you are going to be driven to harder times. Right. 
and more pragmatic times. That just natu- it's just competition, more competition in the world. The New York, U.S. is no longer the center of the, of the universe but then, economically. This gets back to now the definition of neoliberalism because somebody might say, well, why did we have to have free trade with those guys? Why don't we just lock them out of our market and uh, then uh, we would be fine? And maybe that's an anti-neoliberalist stance. I don't know. But um, the, these things are very complicated. There was, there's no like, it, it wasn't necessary by the fact of increasing um, international competition, there was no necessary byproduct that we had to cut our own social spending. There's like the logic there. It, it gave people an opportunity for sure. Yeah, we didn't necessarily, I don't know that we, whether or not we had to cut our own social spending, but the pressure on an individual American worker to go more upstream in terms of skills in order to get ahead of these masses of Indians and Chinese. I think that that pressure was real. Yeah, I think that's independent of the social spending, actually. And I think that was inevitable, right? It's, it's, look, I think it's part of the premise of your book. The culture wars were in some sense a luxury of a time which America was preeminent economically. Yeah, I agree with that. As we began to decline. The, certainly the, the flavor of the culture wars that we had in like the 80s and 90s, like Robert Maplethorpe, but that's all a luxury. You can't, you can't have that problem when some Chinese and Indians are threatening to hollow out all of your industries all at once, you know. Exactly, yeah. When we have, or you, when you, have, when you have a problem, you actually don't have enough to eat at home, right? Yeah, like, oh, uh, can we depict that in a museum or not, Corey? I don't know. Well, I actually just want to have food for dinner tonight. Well, and I think that's why Trump is like such a much more visceral culture warrior. Um, he's fighting to keep Mexicans and other what he would call rapists out because he, they're coming here to take our jobs. And it's a much different sense than Maple. Yeah, exactly. That's why I was at the very beginning of this uh, discussion, I was kind of questioning on really has what you are calling the culture war shifted tremendously because I think it's reasonable for Americans to have a process where they decide, should we let one million new Americans into this country per year? Should it be twice that? Should it be half that? Uh, oh, we can't have a national discussion because if I take one side of the discussion, I'm a racist and a Nazi. That That is just not right. And uh, that is the current culture war. And it's very different from like, can Robert Maplethorpe take a photo of somebody peeing on a cross? I mean, those are very different issues. I agree. Or about at the end of our time with you, Andrew. Uh, But thank you very much. This has been a really interesting discussion. 